Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for attending this talk. So just before we start, just a few short words about me. So my name is Martin, and I'm currently running my own consultancy called Coffee Cup Consulting, a little bit of a strange name. Uh, I'm one of the guys which organizes the sessions of the Bulgarian Java user group. We also have our own community conference running in May. And I'm also a part-time OpenJ contribut contributor, so I try to contribute to the OpenJDK platform when I have some time. And I'm also a big fan of the RabbitMQ message broker, where I authored a book a few months ago called Learning RabbitMQ. So that's shortly about me. And about this talk, so we'll track actually the evolution of the Java security model. And basically, this is a knowledge which is essential to every Java developer, whether he's working in the field of application server development or not. Then we'll fulfill the talk with uh, discussing what are the security APIs in the JDK platform that fulfill the security portfolio of Java. And at the end of the talk, we'll cover a few best practices that every Java developer must consider when he knows what is the security sandbox model of the Java platform. So uh, let's see what's the evolution of the Java security model along with some examples. And traditionally, as most of you know, when you start working in a company, you get a security policy you have to read. Not always, but at some point you need to read the security policy. And many companies try to establish a very rigid security policy that says that every communication between employees must be SSH enabled, for example. Sorry, SSL enabled. So essentially many companies also deploy antivirus software firewalls, whether these are software or hardware based. They also deploy intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems. So by all means, companies try, try to protect their assets. However, with the evolution of technologies, and in particular with the upcoming technologies that provide the ability to run source code in the browser, such as, for example, Java applets, a number of security concerns emerge. And for example, imagine that you run an applet that is able to open up a connection to another workstation, or for example, to write to your file system. You can imagine that this opens up a whole new world of security vulnerabilities inside your system. So with the emerging of technologies that allow you to run source code from the browser, you need to have a very strict security model that will allow you to specify what does these applications are allowed to do inside the system. And this is how basically the security sandbox model in Java um, starts to evolve. So basically the, the goal of the oops, the goal of the security model. Sorry, there is no input. We we have to Okay, so now, now that's fine. So basically the goal of the Java Security Sandbox is to allow you to execute untrusted code from a number of locations and to uh, provide you with the ability to specify permissions for that source, co source code. So essentially when you run applets in your browser, you need to specify what permissions apply for each applet so that they're able to run securely in your browser. And in version 1.0, just some 20 years ago, uh, the first model was created inside the JDK platform, which allowed you to execute applets in a secure manner. And basically, there were two domains of source code that were um, created in the JDK platform. The first domain was the, do the trusted domain. And in the trusted domain was only the system code. These were the libraries in the JDK that were allowed to do whatever they want with the system, to write files, to open socket connections, and so on and so forth. And in the other domain were the applets. So basically, the applets were in the untrusted domain, which was very restricted. And you had to specify what are all of the applets allowed or not allowed to do. So the model was as simple as that. So code in the JVM was divided into two domains, trusted and untrusted. And basically, strict restrictions were applied by default on the untrusted domain. However, this was not very flexible at all. So in version 1.1 of the JDK platform, a little bit more flexible model was introduced. 
So at that point in time, uh, the folks in Sun decided to provide a mechanism for applet signing, which allowed, allowed you to move basically applets from the untrusted domain to the trusted system domain. So once you have your applet signed with a trusted certificate, you mark them as trusted source code, and you, they have the ability to do whatever they want with the system. So now you have a little bit more flexible mechanism. You have your applets which are still untrusted and are based uh, upon permission checking, but you also have the so-called signed applets which are trusted in the same manner as system code is as well. And now you basically have the same thing, but with a little bit of a one step ahead, which is signed applets. So this is, in short, the process of applet signing. You compile the applet in the usual manner. Then you create a jar file for your applet. Then you generate a pair of public-private key pairs in order to sign content. Then you sign the applet jar with the private key file. Then you export the public certificate out of the public key you have generated. Then you import that certificate into the trusted store of your JDK that's running inside your browser. After that, you create a policy file where you specify what is the untrusted source code allowed to do. And in the end, you load and run the applets. So this is basically the process of signing uh, an, an applet that allowed you to grant him more permissions, and basically the permissions that the system domain has. However, this still remained quite inflexible. So in version 1.2, there was a radical change in the JDK platform in terms of security, and the security manager class was introduced. So does anyone know what a security manager is? Yeah, a couple of people. So the security manager uh, provided the capability to do more robust permission checking in terms of the source code. So now that uh, we had uh, a security manager class in version JDK 1.2, there was the so-called security.policy file that you get when you install your uh, Java. And basically, the security policy file says that you give some permission to applets loaded from a particular location. So this could not only be applets, of course. This could be any type of managed source codes. For example, this could be OSGI plugins. This could be WAR files, and so on and so forth. So in this particular case, we give the right to all applets loaded from the jdays.se site slash demo applet the, the permission to delete the C Windows folder. So basically, when you specify that permission uh, in the default security policy file that comes with the Java installation, and you install an instance of a security manager class, then the Java platform, any time it runs the applet, it checks whether it has the permission to delete the C Windows folder whenever, whenever the applet tries to do so. Uh, so basically, as you can see, the security model has moved from um, tr standard trusted and untrusted domain to more code-centric. And this means that access control decisions are now specified in a more fine-grained manner in a security policy file that comes with the Java installation. And there is no more the notion of untrusted and trusted source code. Everything is a subject of permission checking. And also, the notion of so-called protection domain was introduced. This is the, essentially the replacement of untrusted and trusted source code. So the protection domain essentially contained, contains the location of where the applet is being loaded from, which is set by the applet's class loader, and also the set of effective permissions that are specified in the security policy, which this applet has when it runs inside the uh, Java in the browser. So basically, now we have also two types of protection domains, system and application. And that's it. How can you get the protection domain of a class inside of your applet? You say domain, And essentially, you can get the protection domain for any class running inside your Java platform by calling getClass.getProtectionDomain. Out of that protection domain, you can get the source code or the code location from where your applets are being loaded from. And you can get the set of effective permissions that are set for that particular class once it's being loaded. 
And another interesting facts also apply in terms of permission checking. So for example, if you provide one applet with the abil ability to delete the C Windows folder, this implies the permission that you are also allowed to delete the C Windows System32 folder. So effectively, permissions can imply each other. Another interesting thing is that also permissions uh, code the location of where your applets are being loaded implies the location of other applets. For example, if you specify permissions for applets loaded from jdays.ese, this implies the same permissions for all applets loaded from jdays.se slash demo applet subdomain. So effectively, this provides you with a mechanism that you can, um, you can imply the location of one applet from the location of another applet. Okay, just a second to see if that's okay. Okay, now that's fine. So, since now we have permissions that are specified for each Java class, typically you know that your source code can run through multiple threads of execution. And uh, since basically uh, classes can be loaded by different class loaders, and the class loader is the one that specifies the protection domain for your class, you can run through different protection domains. For example, if I have to give you a concrete example, if you have a Java application server, and that server runs uh, a WAR files inside of it. For example, the WAR file is loaded by one class loader and the application server is run by an, a separate class loader. And now the, when you run the WAR file inside your application server, it has two protection domains, one of the WAR file itself and one of the Java application server. So effectively, uh, what was decided was that the permission set or the effective permission set of uh, the WAR file would be the intersection of all protection domains through which those WAR file is being loaded. So this means that, for example, the protection domain of the WAR file will be the set of permissions of the WAR file itself, which are specified by the Java running inside the application server, and also the permission set of the application server itself. So effectively, the set of permissions for your WAR file will be the intersection of permissions of the application server and of the WAR file. So moving towards version 1.3 and 1.4 of the JDK platform, the security model remains the same. We, we still have the security managers that might be installed in your Java platform. However, uh, the notion of um, permission checking also was a little bit more extended. So does anyone know what JAS is? Yeah? Java authentication and authorization service. So you are close, but you win a book on, yeah, on RabbitMQ. You can get it after the session. Yeah. So effectively, just as you mentioned, is Java authentication and authorization service. And the idea, idea behind JAS was that up to version 1.3 of the JTK platform, there was no way to specify who was running the source code. You had just the location of the applet, for example, and you had the set of effective permissions, but you, there was no way out of the box to specify who is running the applet, who is the user that runs the applet. So that was the purpose of JAS, and it was effectively to specify who is running the applet. And now the syntax of the security policy file was extended a little bit, and it allowed you to specify the so-called security principles which are effectively some attributes of the user of the system. This could be an email, a username, and so on and so forth. So now in the security policy file, you can specify who has some permissions over the applet. In this particular example, you say grant principle javax.security.out.x500.x500 principle, and this effectively is an LDAP attribute of the user, and this LDAP attribute is the name of Tom, so an user, a user which has this LDAP attribute and runs the applet is effectively allowed to delete the C Windows folder. So in version 1.3 and 1.4 of the JDK platform, the notion of authentication and authorization was introduced in the security model. And a few implications of that were that uh, 
the Java authentication and authorization service uh, had effectively two parts, um, as it is somewhat obvious. So the first part, effectively, the, or the authorization part, is the one that extends the security model of the Java platform. And the authentication part of JAS was based on the idea of plugging authentication modules, which allowed you to implement different modules for authentication of your users, whether that's authentication against a relational database, an LDAP server, and so on and so forth. And you can use those models to authenticate users in your Java applications or your Java EE applications, for example. So the, ja the JAS actually, the JAS API consists, consists of uh, four core classes. Uh, the first one of them, if I start from the back, is javax.security.out.login.login context. So when you start, authenticating or authorizing users in your system, you use an instance of this login context class that uses one or more login modules that you have implemented in your system. The JDK platform provides a few login modules, such as, for example, an LDAP authentication module that allows you to authenticate against an LDAP server. So basically, those two classes allow you to provide one, one or more ways to authenticate a user. For example, you can specify that you want to authenticate a user against an LDAP server, and if that fails, you can try to authenticate the user alter alternatively against an, a relational database. Each login module specifies uh, one or more subjects, which are actually the authenticated entities in the system. So a subject in just represent, represents a user in your system, and a subject has one or more attributes called principles. So a principle could be the username, or the email address, or the home address of the user, and so on and so forth. So these are the four core classes that constitute the JAS API, and that are used uh, as part of the Java security architecture as well. So up to version 1.4 now, the typical flow for permission checking is the following. Once, for example, an application server or an OGI container starts up, it sets a security manager instance. This process is called uh, installation of a security manager. And it also sets uh, some security policy. By default, as we saw earlier, the security policy is established in a security.policy file, which stays in the installation of the Java platform. But that policy can be in a different location, for example, in a database table, and so on and so forth. So this is the first step. The application server starts up, and it installs a security manager. The second step, once your applications, for example, applets or WAR files are loaded, then during the class loading process, bytecode verification is done in order to uh, check whether something is not wrong with your class files. And after bytecode verification is done, then the protection domain of the current, uh, for the current class loader is set. That is being set for all classes that are loaded by that, that class loader. And during that phase, effectively, the class loader sets the set of effective permissions that are specified in the security policy file, along with the location of your loaded WAR files or applets. So this is the second step. The classes are already loaded, and they have a protection domain, which contains the set of permissions for the class and the location from where that class is loaded from. In the third step, when you invoke some system code from your applications, for example, you try to write a file to C Windows folder or somewhere else, then the JDK platform checks whether you have a security manager installed. And if you do, then it tries to check whether the set of permissions of your executing code is allowed to perform the activity you want to do. For example, to write to the file system, to open a socket connection, and so on and so forth. And basically, as we said earlier, this is the intersection of all of the protection domains through which your executing source code passes. So for example, if you have a WAR file, one protection domain can be the one of the source code of the WAR file, and the second protection domain through which the execution passes could be that of the application server. And inside the uh, code base of the Java platform, you can find many places when, where there are calls similar, similar to this one. You create an instance of a socket permission, 
which effectively uh, is a socket permission for jdays.se between ports 8000 and 9000. And this permission effectively specifies whether you have the ability to connect to that location or to accept connections from that location. After you have created an instance of that permission, you check whether you have a security manager instance installed in your system. You say system.getSecurityManager, and if that thing is not null, you say securitymanager.checkPermission, and you specify that permission. So when you have that piece of source code inside the JDK platform, for example, if the currently executing source code, uh, the protection domain of the currently executing source code has the permission to open a socket connection to that location, then that thing passes well. Otherwise, a security exception is being raised at that location. So there are many places when, for example, you try to write to the file system, for example, from a WAR file or from an applet, and you get a security exception. And the reason is that you just don't have the permission as specified in your security policy file to do so. So the first step actually is that, apart from the fact that the JDK does typically the permission checking, you can also have those type of calls in your application, of course, as well. And that could not only be the application server that tries to do any kind of permission checking, but also your application in case you, for example, provide the ability to run plugins inside your application. So typically, you can do permission checking either with a security manager or newer versions of the JDK platform use an instance of an access controller. So an access controller is basically the same API as the security manager class with one core difference. You don't need to install an instance of an access controller inside your system. So you can say access controller dot check permission and then specify the permission without the need to have an instance of a security manager installed inside your system. And effectively, the security manager APIs uses this access controller class uh, in order to do permission checking. So it's basically the same thing. Uh, and the fifth step is that actually at some points in time you may need to do the so-called privilege, pri privilege escalation inside your source code. So for example, imagine the case that you run a WAR file inside an applet application server. And your application server needs to write to the file system and needs to do some logging. But imagine that your WAR file does not have the permission to write to the file system. In that case, if you try to log something from the WAR file, you'll get a security exception that you don't have the permission to write to the file system. For that reason, the application server will need to escalate privileges by calling access controller dot do privileged and execute the particular piece of code that writes to the, um, to the logging utility inside the application server like this. So in many applica Java application servers, you may find a lot of calls like this access controller dot do privilege something that basically bypass the security policy uh, that might be in effect for the particular application server. You may also do the same thing, but for different users. So for example, you can execute one piece of code as a different user by calling subject.doas. And you can do the same thing by calling subject.doas privileged. And in that manner, you can change the user and also make the call privileged as in access controller dot do privileged call. And of course, there are many examples where there are some custom implementations of a Java security manager. For example, the Java platform, as we saw it like this, implemented the security manager that did permission checking against the security.policy file. However, if you want to write stored procedures, let's say in an Oracle database, then the Java virtual machine that runs inside the Oracle database has its own custom implementation of a security manager that does permission checking against permission specified in a special system a relational table. And this custom implementation basically runs inside the uh, Oracle JVM that runs inside the Oracle database. So, so this is one particular example of a custom implementation of a security manager. So moving towards version 1.5 and 1.6 of the Java platform, there are just some slight enhancements of this security model. For example, an LDAP support was provided for JAS. 
Uh, and in version 1.7 and 1.8 of the Java platform, still a few more enhancements were made, such as, for example, calling access controller .do privileged and also specifying subset of permissions that are allowed for the currently executing source code. So in previous versions of Java, you, you had to call access controller .do privileged and this would effectively strip away any permissions of the calling uh, of the calling source code. However, in version 1.7, you can specify also a subset of provisions against which you can you want to escalate privileges. And moving towards the new version of Java, which is upcoming hopefully in a year. So in version JDK 1.9 and beyond, we'll have modules in terms of Project Jigsaw. So how many of you know what Project Jigsaw is? Okay, half of the people. So effectively, Project Jigsaw is an effort to provide a module system inside the JDK platform that would allow developers to write modules and um, basically to run them inside the Java platform. So typically, for that reason, the JDK platform provides a separate uh, so-called module class loader for loading Jigsaw modules. And as you can imagine, this class loader will set a particular code base for the JDK module and a different set of permissions for that module. So in effect, the security sandbox model would directly apply to Java modules once they come up in version 1.9. So each module will be a subject of permission checking in the same manner as applets and WAR files, for example, are. And it, that will eventually happen. And of course, by modules, um, to summarize, we understand modules as they are defined by Project Jigsaw. So this would be the reference implementation of a module system inside the Java platform. And of course, each module will have its own protection domain. So the classes of the module will have their own protection domain. Yeah. So just to refine a little bit more on that, um, the modularization of the Java platform will basically use still the same security model in the Java platform. No other changes are expected to happen, but still this would allow for some slight improvements uh, in terms of how permission checking is being done. So that was basically the evolution of the Java security model throughout the versions of the JDK platform. Apart from that security model, there are a number of APIs which are provided for all developers building applications, uh, building Java applications. And these APIs actually fulfill the security portfolio of the JDK platform. So we'll just discuss shortly what are these APIs and what capabilities do they provide for developers. So we have the Java cryptography architecture. We have the public key infrastructure utilities that allow you to build a robust public key infrastructure or to use an existing public key infrastructure. For, but for the purpose of certificate revocation and so on. You also have the sec Java Secure Socket extensions, which are just an extension of the standard socket mechanism in Java. We also have the Java GCC GSS API, which is an alternative to the Java Secure Socket extensions API. And we also have the Java Simple Authentication and Security layer, which provides you with the mechanism to exchange authentication data between the client and the server. So let's look briefly at each of those APIs and what do they provide. So the Java cryptography ar architecture provides the ability to create digital certificates, to create message digests, and also to use different types of, for example, cryptographic shifters. And the Java platform typically does not provide concrete implementation of those utilities, but it provides an abstract layer that allows you to implement yourself any type of algorithm. And there are libraries that provide concrete implementations of those APIs. For example, the Bouncy Castle library is a notorious library that implements a number of cryptography uh, APIs from the Java platform. And the JCA has a pluggable architecture in that manner. It's also independent from, from any algorithm that you may implement and that may run inside the Java platform. And the JCA API continues to evolve, especially in terms of more robust algorithms for uh, establishing uh, cryptographic communication, 
a more robust algorithm for uh, creating stronger cryptographic shifters and so on and so forth. The PKI utilities, on the other hand, provide mechanisms for working with security certificates, certificate revocation lists, the OCSP protocol, which is an alternative way to, to check whether a certificate is valid or not in the same way as certificate revocation lists do, and also for working with key stores and trust stores in the uh, Java platform. Does anyone know actually what's the difference between a key store and a trust store? Yeah? Anyone? Yeah? Uh, a key store contains keys and the trust store contains certificate for trusted. Trusted certificates, okay, yeah, that's correct. So the key store basically contains any installed certificates that you might have uh, and want to use in your application and the trust store basically uh, has a list of all of the certificates you trust when you want to do something. So basically, this is in general what the PKI utilities in the Java platform provide. So here is a, just a short overview of how certificate revocation works. So basically, you have a security certificate, and you can either check whether that certificate is valid against the certificate revocation list provided by the cert certificate authority, or you can use the OCSP protocol to check whether that certificate is valid. And the PKI utilities in the Java platform provide you with a mechanism to establish that checking of your public certificates. And also the PKI utilities continue ev to evolve with the versions of the Java platform, especially in terms of more support for managing your certificates and keys. Uh, the third API we'll look into is the Java Secure Socket extension, which is just an alternative of uh, the standard Java sockets, but with uh, support for SSL. And the Java Secure Socket extension also continues to evolve. There is something called server name identification, which basically provides you with the ability to create a server socket inside the Java platform that splits the communication between clients into different virtual domains on the server side. Also, the Java GSS API. So that's an API that provides an alternative for communication between the client and the server in the same manner as the Java Secure Socket extension API does. But the difference here is that uh, the GSS API uses tokens-based security in order to exchange token information between the client and the server. So it works in a little bit different manner than the Java Secure Socket extension. And also the GSS API can be used along with JAS. For authentication purposes, it can use the JAS modules to authenticate users. Also, the GSS API continues to evolve, especially in terms of support for more security certificates. For example, uh, the Java platform tries to support newer versions of the Kerberos protocol, both in terms of uh, GSS and in terms of any other APIs that would need to use the Kerberos series of protocols. Um, the Java SASL API defines a protocol for exchange of authentication data. And this means that, for example, if you want to authenticate a user against the server, the SASL API provides with a me mechanism to specify how this user must be authenticated. For example, whether that should be via an email address, whether that should be via an username and a password. And that security information is being exchanged between the client and the server. So the client says, hey, I want to authenticate uh, users with an email address. The server says, well, that I support that. That's fine. Let's do that. And in that way, a secure channel for sending authentication data is being established between the client and the server. So that's effectively the, what does the Java SASL API does. And it also continues to evolve. Uh, it also tries to support more mechanisms for exchanging of authentication data. It tries to, for example, to provide support for um, integrating of the server with an LDAP uh, server that provides attributes for establishing authentication data between the client and the server, and so on and so forth. And now in the last part of this talk, having covered the Java Security Sandbox model and the supporting APIs in the JDK platform, now let's see a few good practices that every developer will need to follow, having in mind this security model. 
So the first thing is that typically some of the security guidelines that you can find over the internet are not specific to the Java platform itself. So there is an input validation you need to do, for example, if you send some data from the client. You have to avoid SQL injection by sanitizing your SQL queries and so on and so forth. However, there are some practices that are specific to the Java platform, and one of them, for example, is the ability and the need to respect the security manager. For example, you, when, if you decide to develop a Java library, you need to take into consideration the fact that your library will need to run, for example, in a Java application server or an, in a OSGI environment. And I had an example recently where I had to use the Google's JSON library inside an OSGI bundle. So when I tried to use the library in order to unmarshal uh, JSON, it threw a security exception. And the reason for that was because the library was using reflective calls to do the unmarshaling, and the reflective calls were subject to permission checking. So I did not have permissions in my OSGI container to effectively do reflective calls, and that threw exceptions at me. And the way the JSON library could have handled this is by providing an alternative way to do the unmarshaling in case it was running, for example, in a Java application server. For example, not to use reflective calls or to provide some more descriptive information to the user why there is a security um, exception. The other thing is that you, ne you, you need to grant minimal set of permissions when you deal with uh, the security policy. Uh, I guess there are many cases where we have seen some code that throws some security exception, and you have worked around this by specifying all privileges for your source, source code. So many developers do this in order to avoid types of security exceptions, but this, uh, as you can think of it, is very hazardous. So typically one rule of thumb is to just grant the minimal set of permissions your source code will need to have in order to do its job. And of course, in that regard, if you do copy-pasting, this, this can automatically translate security bugs in your, in your application. So this is also one of the reasons you need to avoid copy-pasting. And this is, of course, not specific to Java. Another thing is that, for example, the ability to sanitize exception messages. So it's a good practice if you sanitize messages and not show exception stack traces to the user, because Java exception stack traces can bring valuable information for your system, and that will, does not need to be visible to the end user. So you typically need to sanitize, sanitize your stack traces. So that was it. Thank you for this talk, and I guess we have time for questions. Yeah? What is your experience regarding uh, ops teams? Because in my experience, they don't even know about the uh, security file, the policy file, and every, everything can, do, can be done, really. Like, uh, you can have reflection, you can have uh, socket binding, mm -hmm. you can have anything. And I'm done, sorry. Yeah, so to repeat the question, the question is how can uh, DevOps teams handle situations like, for example, uh, having to deal with any type of security exceptions that may arise in the system? Was, was that the question? My question. My question was more about your experience because yeah. in mine, ops team don't know nothing about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And you are talking in front of developers. I yep. would be very glad that you talk in front of Ops Team. Yep. Uh, okay, so my experience with Ops Teams is that, for example, if a uh, situation arises that the system throws a type of, for example, a security exception when having to deal with some type of activity, uh, then it becomes very confusing. And the Ops Team tries to go to the developer team and ask them, here, see, I have some security exception. I don't know what to do with that. So in order to avoid that situation, for example, if you develop an application or a Java library, you need to be able to handle all places where uh, potentially security exceptions might be thrown and to provide more, more meaningful information on what could be the cause for the security exception. For example, if you get some type of uh, reflective call exception in your application, you'll get very confused from what, what's the reason for that security exception. It's not very user-friendly. 
So one thing is just to wrap any type of security exception that may arise and make it more readable. And the other thing, of course, is to, to educate the ops team. So once, for example, people are aware of how, in general, does the security sandbox model of the Java platform work, they, for example, can just go to the security policy file in the system and check what are the permissions that are being granted to that security policy file. That, that typically does not require any developer knowledge, since the security policy file has a very uh, tiny uh, domain-driven language that is used to describe the permission set. Of course, you can have other sources of permission checking, not a security policy file, but still that, of course, depends on the scenario. But these two things, I think, are very important. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Okay, if not, then thank you for attending this talk, and if you have any questions, just come to me and ask directly. Yeah. Thank you. Um.